Good afternoon. Uh, my update today is going to be a little bit longer than normal as I have some important information to convey, including on shielding. But first, I will give an update as usual on the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,639 positive cases confirmed. That's an increase of 18 from yesterday. A total of 1,042 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total increase of 40 from yesterday, including an increase of nine in the number of confirmed cases in hospital. A total of 24 people last night were in intensive care with either confirmed or suspected cases of the virus, and that is a decrease of one since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,799 patients who had tested positive and required hospital treatment for the virus have now been able to leave hospital. And in the past 24 hours, no deaths have been registered of patients confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. The total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement therefore remains at 2,415. Now this is, of course, the second day in a row that no deaths have been registered in the preceding 24 hours. This is obviously very encouraging. I can't tell you how much I've longed to report such a development, and I know all of you will have longed to hear that. But even so, we must still exercise caution. Uh, we know from previous weeks that fewer deaths tend to be registered at weekends, so it is still highly likely that more COVID deaths will be recorded in the days ahead, but I very much hope that we will continue to see a steady decline. As always, of course, I want to stress that the figures I have been reporting over the past few weeks are not just statistics, they represent individuals whose loss is a source of sorrow to many. My deepest condolences are with everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. And I also want to express again my thanks to our health and care workers for the incredible work that you continue to do in very testing circumstances. And today, I want to convey a special message, uh, and it's a message very much from my heart to everybody who is watching. I want to take a moment again to thank you for the sacrifices you have made in recent weeks. I know how painful many of these sacrifices have been, not being able to see family, especially grandchildren, or attend funerals of loved ones, or celebrate special occasions. These are times in our lives that we don't get back and the experience, the worry and the loneliness of these weeks will live with all of us forever. That's true for everyone, but it is and will continue to be especially so for those in the shielded category who I will address directly in a moment. But I want all of you, whether you're shielded or not, to know that I am acutely aware of this in every single decision I take. And there are no words that will ever adequately express the sorrow I feel for all that you have gone through, or indeed the gratitude I feel for the way that you have borne it. I also know that as you listen to me report statistics that are now going in a positive direction, you'll be asking if these sacrifices remain necessary. And as you witness some people, even just a minority, not abiding by the rules, I suspect you may also be asking, why should I bother? I understand all of that, I really, really do, and I share the frustration at times as well. But sticking with this for a bit longer really does matter. These painful but necessary sacrifices have brought us to where we are today with this virus in retreat. In retreat, but not gone, and still posing a real risk, especially to the most clinically vulnerable. And that's the key point I guess I want to make to you uh, today at this point. This is such a crucial juncture in our battle against this virus. We will either keep going, keep beating it back as we are now, or we will give it the chance to roar back with a vengeance. We must, must do the former. If we break the chains of transmission even more and drive down the number of new cases to a lower base, the safer it will then be to more meaningfully ease the restrictions and speed up our journey back to some normality. And if we do keep making the progress we have in the last few weeks, I am optimistic that 10 days from now at the next formal review, we will be able to move, at least in part, into the next phase 
of our route map out of lockdown, with more individual freedoms restored and more businesses able to open up and operate again. But that depends on all of us. It depends on each and every one of us. So please, please stick with it for now. Every day that we do does bring us closer to getting back to a form of normality. But today I want to thank each and every one of you for all of those sacrifices that you have been making. Now, the main and difficult issue I want to talk about today is shielding. I want to give as much of an update as I can for the approximately 180,000 people across Scotland who have been shielding. Shielding because we know you're at greatest risk of becoming seriously ill or dying from this virus. Our initial advice back in March was for you to shield until the 18th of June, and I know that you are anxious about what happens next. This is not an easy update to give, and I know it will not be an easy one for you to hear. But it is important that we set out for you our current expectations at this stage. And I should say you will receive a letter from the Chief Medical Officer shortly with the information that I am about to give you. The advice for you to shield has been necessary to protect you from harm. And for now, it remains necessary. But I'm well aware that such a long period of isolation causes its own harms and distress. For all of these reasons, we want, as soon as we possibly can, to move to a better position where we can give you more tailored advice on the risks associated with your specific condition and then set out what you can do to mitigate those risks and how we can support you to live more normally. However, to do that properly and safely, we need more clinical and scientific evidence than we have right now. And I'll say a bit more about that in a few moments. For the moment, though, despite the progress that has been made in reducing levels of COVID in the community, the virus still poses a very significant threat to you. I'm afraid, therefore, that our recommendation at this stage is that you should continue to shield until the 31st of July. We are, however, likely to amend our current guidance so that from next week you can go outside to exercise, and I will say more about that shortly. The support you currently receive will, of course, still be available. At present, more than 50,000 shielding people receive free weekly grocery boxes and 46,000 have registered for priority online delivery with supermarkets. That's in addition to the services local pharmacists are providing and the help given by local authorities and the third sector. All of these services will continue, and even if you haven't needed them up until now, you can still access them if you need them in future. And I promise you, and I want to say this uh, very directly and very sincerely to you, I promise you that we are not going to forget about you between now and the end of July. During that period, we will consider on an ongoing basis whether any further easing is possible. And if we can bring shielding in its current form to an end earlier than the end of July, we will do so. But we judge now that it is better to give you that clarity of a backstop date at this stage. And please be assured that we are working hard to provide that more tailored approach for you so that from the end of July at the latest, you can enjoy more normality in your life. And what does that mean? We know that not every person who is shielding faces exactly the same risks. So we're working to develop tools that will allow you and your clinicians to take into account your specific condition and also other factors like your age or ethnicity in order to give you a better sense of the risks that you face. As part of that, we're also looking for ways to help you understand the changing risk of infection in your own local area. And once this evidence is available, we will start providing more specific advice for you so that you can understand the safest ways to go back to a more normal life. Uh, we're working on this with clinicians and scientific advisors across the four nations of the UK. It is worth stressing that some of these issues are really complex and new clinical evidence is becoming available constantly. However, we do hope to make this more detailed advice available over the next few weeks. Before then, for the period from the 18th of June onwards, uh, that's from next uh, Thursday, a week on Thursday onwards, we've been considering what steps we can safely take now. We now know that the risk of catching uh, the virus outdoors if you stay two metres apart from other people is relatively low, not zero, but uh, lower than it is indoors. 
And so we're currently expecting them from Thursday the 18th of June, anybody who is shielding, unless they live in a nursing or a residential care home, will be able to go outdoors for exercise. There will be no limit on how long or how often you can go out each day. We hope that this will provide some boost for your quality of life, particularly if you live in a home that doesn't have a garden or which has limited space without greatly increasing the risks that you face. Assuming that this change goes ahead, and I currently expect that that will be the case, you'll be able to go out for exercise, for example, a walk, wheel, run or cycle. However, you should stay two metres away from others while you're out. We will not recommend yet that you take part in sports such as golf or tennis, and you should still avoid meeting up with other households, even in a physically distanced setting. I know that in particular is really hard, but we want to avoid the possibility at this stage of creating additional risks. For people who live in nursing or residential care homes, I'm afraid that any change to the guidance and exercise from the 18th of June will not yet apply to you, but we will change our advice for you as soon as we confidently can do so. In relation to education, we've already published guidance to clarify that children who are shielding should not be expected to return until it's safe. Instead, they should be supported to receive education at home or in a way that best meets their needs. And in relation to work, of course, the starting point for everyone, uh, regardless of whether or not you are shielding, should be that you work from home where possible. But if you are shielding, you're not expected to return to a workplace until at least the 31st of July. And I want to be clear that employers should do everything they can to help you work from home safely. Nobody, nobody should be penalised for following medical guidance. Before I finish, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the support made available to people who are shielding is only possible because different organisations have worked together. That includes national and local government, the third sector, supermarkets and wholesalers and the NHS. And these services depend on a lot of hard work from a lot of people. For example, the staff in local authority assistance centres, delivery drivers, volunteers and many others. And I want to say thank you to all of them. I also know that for anyone who lives with someone who is shielding, this has been a particularly stressful time. And I want to particularly acknowledge the support that you have been providing in incredibly difficult circumstances. But of course, most of all, I want to say thank you to those of you who are shielding. Obviously, I don't know from my own personal experience just how difficult this has been for you. So I'm not going to pretend to you that I do but I can imagine how difficult this has been. And I know that many of you listening today will be very disappointed that shielding is to continue uh, for some time yet. Uh, I want to assure you, though, that this is not a decision we take lightly. It's one that weighs very heavily on all of us, including on me. But it is for your protection. And I hope that our advice on exercise, should it come into force next week, as I expect it will do, will make a difference for many of you. And I also promise that we will ease our guidance again before the end of July if we are confident that we can do so safely. And I guarantee that in the weeks ahead, you will continue to be absolutely central to all of our thinking. Now, I want to conclude today just by emphasising again the key public health guidance for all people outside of the shielding group. You should still be staying home most of the time and you should still be meeting fewer people than you normally would. When you do meet people from another household, you must stay outdoors and you must stay two metres apart from them. Don't meet with more than one other household at a time. Don't meet more than one a day and keep to a maximum, a maximum of eight people in a group. Wash your hands often. If you're out and about, take hand sanitizer with you. Wear a face covering when you're in shops or in public transport. Avoid touching hard surfaces and clean any that you do touch. And of course, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, you must get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. Above all else, all of us must remember right now that the decisions we take as individuals continue uh, to have an impact on the health and well-being of all of us. And if we all do the right thing, then we will continue to slow the spread of this virus and we will save lives and we will bring forward uh, much closer that day when all of us can begin to get back to some normality. So my thanks again to all of you, my thanks in particular to those watching in the shielded category. I know how difficult what I have just uh, reported to you will be 
Uh, but let me repeat that promise that we have not and will not forget you. Now, given the uh, time I've taken to go through that update today, uh, we're going to move straight to questions. But, of course, the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Secretary uh, are uh, with me today uh, in order to answer questions. Uh, but I'll go firstly uh, for the first question to Katie Hunter from BBC Scotland. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to ask about testing, if that's OK. On May the 1st, um, you announced expanded care home testing in three areas. That was all staff in homes where there was an outbreak, staff in homes in a chain where there was an outbreak, and also um, sampling in homes with no outbreaks. Then on May the 16th, Health Protection Scotland released guidance saying that there's unlikely to be physical or laboratory test capacity to extend testing in all three of these areas simultaneously. Hence, some local NHS board level prioritisation will be necessary. Now, Health Protection Scotland seemed to be saying on May the 16th, health boards didn't have the resourcing to fully implement the May 1st policy. Since then, obviously, you've made several further announcements on testing. And I'm just wondering if it's still the case that health boards are having to prioritise because they don't have the resources to fully implement the Scottish Government's policy on testing. Uh, no, all of these uh, programmes of testing are underway. The Health Secretary has spoken uh, more about that in recent days. She has uh, written to health boards uh, on Friday to underline uh, our expectations of them in terms of making sure that the policy commitments we've made on testing are fully implemented and implemented as quickly as possible and that's been monitored uh, closely and we've uh, also said that we will begin to publish data broken down health board by health board um, as soon as we are able to do that. Uh, we have uh, lots of testing capacity right now. We have built testing capacity uh, continuously and progressively over uh, the last uh, number of weeks. We are not yet using all of that testing capacity, so that capacity and those resources are there. Um, and if any health board is uh, has got concerns about uh, limitations of resources, then they know that they are able to speak to the Scottish Government and we will work with them to address them. But the policy intention is clear, and as is our determination to see it implemented in full. Uh, but I'll ask the Health Secretary if she wants to add any more. Uh, only one point, First Minister, to what you've already said. I spoke uh, myself with the Chief Executives of all our NHS boards on Friday morning uh, about this and about the letter that I'd issued to them and my expectation on that and during that conversation there were no concerns raised at all about resourcing both resourcing to take the test samples as well as of course the capacity in our laboratories to process those tests which as the first minister says we have that capacity so we now uh, anticipate uh, seeing a much more consistent approach to testing and care homes uh, to deliver that national policy uh, than uh, we had seen, uh, although many boards had already undertaken it across all the areas that we'd asked them to. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stephen Brown from STV. Um, First Minister, you'll be aware of the some 240 jobs that are, are at risk uh, from the Creep Hydro Group uh, at the moment, and indeed other hotel jobs across uh, Scotland as well. Uh, those in charge there are saying that they need more bespoke help to try uh, over the next few months, particularly in the summer season, to help them through it. So what additional support will you give them and indeed those who now face redundancy in this industry? Well, let me say uh, a couple of things in response to that. Firstly, I uh, understand uh, the severe difficulty that all sectors of our economy are uh, facing right now, but particularly uh, the, the tourism and hospitality sectors who have been particularly hard hit and are likely because of the nature of this virus and the nature of the steps we have to take to tackle it to be hit for longer than uh, some businesses in other sectors. Uh, Fergus Ewing, uh, who is the Minister uh, with responsibility for tourism, is uh, liaising closely with businesses uh, in this sector and with the sector overall and we will carefully consider the form and nature of support that is required in the months uh, to come. And, and we will do that very carefully, uh, taking account of the, the different circumstances uh, that businesses are facing. And we've got to recognise that in a, a sector, uh, like the tourist sector, there is a, a very wide variety of businesses that will be experiencing this in, in different ways. But we take very seriously our responsibility to help as much as we can. Uh, tourism is important uh, to Scotland financially and economically, but it is important in terms of our, our brand as a country and our reputation internationally. And we want to get it back to normal as quickly as possible. And, and that is my 
Uh, second uh, and final point, I suppose, is the determination we have to allow tourism to start to open up and operate again as quickly as it is safe to do so. We would not be doing, and I would not be doing, any favours to any sector of our economy if we moved too fast with this and allowed the virus to run out of control again. But we want to see uh, an opening up of our economy generally and tourism and hospitality in particular as quickly as we, we possibly can. We set out the potential phasing for that in the route map. And to come back to the point I was stressing in my opening remarks, we are making significant progress against this virus, but it is at a very sensitive and crucial juncture. And we need to continue to make that progress in order to have the safe foundation to start to lift these restrictions more meaningfully in the weeks to come. And at this stage, while uh, we have to go through the formal review ahead of the 18th of June, which is a week on Thursday, at this stage, I'm optimistic that if we still see uh, the progress that we are making, we will be able to go into the next phase of the route map. Now, that may not be absolutely every aspect of that, because, and we've always been clear about that, but we'll be able to go in to that next phase. Um, and if we can accelerate things from later phases, we've always said we are open to do that. I want to get the economy, tourism, hospitality in particular, uh, back to as much normality as quickly as possible. That is in everybody's interest, but we have to do it safely so that we don't set everybody back again by allowing the virus to run out of control. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. If I could just follow up on that question from my colleague there, uh, that hotel group also includes the uh, People's Hydro, and the Chief Executive spoke of it uh, when they closed down of the darkest day, personal devastation, a family-run firm. Uh, am I to, and, and, and the lots of redundancies, potentially people's jobs at risk, potentially, um, am I to take it from what you've said there that there's really no chance for hotels in the near future of them being able to reopen. And if that's the case, what about the possibility of reopening self-catering accommodation, which is also another important part of tourism, particularly for the south of Scotland? Um, I, I don't think you should take uh, from what I said that there is no chance of certain things happening. I, I, I think what you should take from what I said is that I want to allow businesses to reopen as quickly as possible. But we have to be confident that that is safe to do. And, you know, without putting dates on it, which I absolutely understand everybody wants, but I am not able to do firmly at this stage. So without putting dates on it, my message is if we all continue to take the actions that we've been taking to suppress the virus, then we'll be able to do these things more quickly. And we will do it as quickly as possible. I, uh, you know, my, my heart breaks for businesses, family-owned businesses perhaps in particular that have, you know, in, invested their, their blood, sweat and tears over many years in building up successful businesses to be hit with what we've all been hit with in the last few months. It is absolutely devastating and, you know, it's difficult for me to, to find the words that properly conveys that. And that's why I am so determined and have been so determined all along that we go forward in a way and at a pace that gets the economy back into operation as quickly as possible. But the point I can't escape, and, and there is no point in me trying to tell people that I can escape it, is that if we get that pace wrong, and if we go more quickly than we should, then we risk setting things back. It's a, it's a careful balance. Uh, but right now, we are going firmly in one direction, and that is forwards. And as long as that continues, then I hope over the next few weeks, we will have lots more positive news about businesses being able to get back to some kind of operation. It may not be a way of operating that is identical to uh, the one they had before the virus hit us, because physical distancing, for example, will continue uh, to be necessary, but to get back to some kind of operation as quickly as possible. And that is what uh, everything I do is focused on, that safe, uh, steady and sustainable uh, return to normality that all of us individuals and businesses want to see. Uh, Becky Clark from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. We've been contacted today by a patient in the Shielding Group who only received a letter this morning telling her that today was not the day she'd be allowed to go out, but in fact the original letter she received should have been dated the 18th of this month. 
Now, obviously, you've just updated that guidance now to the 31st of July. And this patient has told us in the last few minutes that she honestly feels like she could cry. She's had two incorrect letters and says being trapped in the house for 12 weeks. She's been clinging on to any sort of information she gets. And while she's constantly checking social media for updates, many people in the same position as her are elderly or vulnerable and they rely on the letters for the information that they need. Now, it's reported that up to all of those people in the shielding group could have been given the wrong date in the letters. Are some of those people still waiting for clarification over the original dates? And how can people in the shielding group trust the letters they're getting through the door when there have been so many errors? Uh, Lou, thank you for that question. There were, and, and this is something I think we addressed some time ago, there, were some, there was a, a, an administrative error in a portion of the letters uh, that, that was corrected. Now, obviously, I don't know about the particular instance you're talking about, if you're able to pass uh, the details uh, confidentially, if, if the individual is, is happy for you to do so, uh, to my office after this briefing, I will personally speak to that individual to apologise for any mistake and to go through some of the information that I've given today. I, I, I mean, I said earlier on, I, I can, and I'm not going to insult people by saying I know what it feels like to be in the shielded category, because clearly I don't, I'm not in the shielded category, but I can imagine how difficult this is. And um, I can imagine how difficult it is to hear that shielding is being extended, albeit we hope with some easing uh, from next week and then hopefully more easing over the period until the 31st of July. We see the next few weeks as a transition into that much more tailored advice that we want to give f uh, to people so that they can assess their own risks and get some uh, agency and normality back into their lives. But I, I just want to say to people in this category, that none of the decisions we are taking here are being taken lightly. This is for your protection. We, all of the things that we have been learning about this virus over the past few weeks are that it is really dangerous for uh, particular groups in, in society and we have to provide as much protection as possible, but we will continue to do that as sensitively and as carefully as we can. Um, and where a letter goes out with the wrong date, I, I deeply and sincerely apologise for that because mistakes like that should not be adding uh, to the distress that you're already feeling and, and I can only apologise for that. Uh, there will be a letter uh, arriving with people shortly from the Chief Medical Officer um, going through some of the information that I've given today uh, and we will try to ensure that whether it's through the SMS service uh, that many have registered for and you can still register for that if you haven't already or through uh, written communication that we provide as much advice and support on an ongoing basis as we possibly can. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thanks, First Minister. Um, in response to my question last Tuesday on the routine testing of care home staff, you said the programme was underway, something you've said again today. But the Chief Nursing Officer added that it would be, in, in her words, in full effect from today. So can you confirm whether or not that routine testing of care home staff across Scotland is now fully in place? It is underway. I've said, I said in Parliament last week, the Health Secretary has repeated that we will be publishing data uh, broken down by Health Board as soon as we have uh, that data in a reliable form. And I, I'd, I'd rather wait until we're able to do that so that people can see for themselves the progress that we are making there. But it is underway. And as the Health Secretary has said, uh, she has underlined very directly to Health Boards the importance of uh, making uh, progress with that as quickly as possible. Do you want to add anything? <clears throat> Simply, as the First Minister said, that as I repeated earlier, I did speak with board chief executives. They all have uh, the letter that we sent last week. Uh, the data is being gathered and we intend to publish that, uh, as First Minister said, as soon as possible. And then we will publish it weekly uh, on an agreed date so that the progress that is being made, remembering that uh, care homes where there is no active case, those care home workers will be tested on a regular basis uh, when the test results come back negative. So we will continue to repeat publishing that data week on week uh, as from the, the week after the first time that we can publish it once the data is robust. Katrine uh, Bussey from PA. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I wanted to ask about the retail sector. Um, from today, there are some shops in Northern Ireland opening up again for business, I believe. And also we're seeing a much more substantial reopening of stores promised in England from next Monday from the 15th. I just wondered, and the retail sector are 
struggling. They were struggling before coronavirus hit. Obviously, they've they've been hit hard. The sector fears that that many shops won't be able to to reopen. Can you give those shops any indication when they may be able to open up their doors to customers again? Well, we, we did set out the likely phasing in the route map and, and that clarity, uh, as far as it goes, is there for uh, the retail sector to see. Uh, the next review will be a week on Thursday, uh, the 18th of June. And I would hope, as I've said already, that we will move into uh, the next phase of the, the route map out of lockdown and that that will include, uh, as the, the route map set out, uh, some movement around uh, small uh, retail in particular. So these are uh, assessments that are ongoing. Um, I... I uh, have said all along, and I will continue to say, because I think it is the only responsible approach to take, that we have to take these decisions at the pace that is right for Scotland and in a way and at a pace that doesn't risk a resurgence of the virus, because that will set all of us back, including businesses and the economy generally. But I very much hope that if we continue to see the progress we are now reporting on a daily basis that that move into the next phase will be uh, possible uh, when I come to give that review a week on Thursday. Um, and we'll be assessing everything uh, very carefully as we uh, move closer to that date. But let me just say, finally, with retail, as with uh, tourism and hospitality, uh, we've got a lot of focus, rightly so and understandably so, at all of these briefings on the health implications of coronavirus because uh, you know, it is putting people into hospital, into intensive care, and it is still uh, taking lives, although all of that, we hope, is starting uh, to reduce. Uh, but we have a very, very clear focus as a government on what we need to do, consistent with our health advice, to get the economy moving again, to get it opened up again, and to continue to provide the support that businesses need. Uh, and I just want to assure people watching that that focus is as strong as our focus uh, on dealing with the health aspects of this emergency. Uh, Severin Carell from The Guardian. <coughs> Hello, First Minister. Can you hear me? Hi. Good afternoon, First Minister. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the question that Katrina asked you about the pace at which you're going to start easing the lockdown, you, you have said consistently that you would follow the evidence and follow the science. But I'm looking at the latest data spreadsheet from the Scottish Government, which shows that there were only 18 positive cases recorded yesterday. There were 21 positive cases reported on, sun, on Saturday. And the trend now is so low that we're down to the level of positive cases that was last seen on the uh, 16th of March. So do you accept that it's possible that you, need, you could accelerate the easing of the lockdown and start reopening businesses far, more, uh, uh, far earlier than your route map had previously suggested? Let me make three quick points to that because it's a perfectly reasonable and legitimate question. Um, Firstly, just a, a caveat, I suppose, and a point of caution, and you'll have heard me say this before, that while we publish the uh, numbers of positive cases each day, that uh, is likely to be an underestimate because that is the positive cases that come through our NHS lab uh, system. Uh, as we start to uh, report, which will hopefully be the case later this week, the data coming through Test and Protect, which comes from the drive-throughs, we will see that uh, the, the, the figures on uh, positive cases reported now are likely to be a slight uh, underestimate. But nevertheless, it is also likely to show, uh, I hope, that it is still on a, a declining uh, trend. The second point I would make is, you know, we are now seeing evidence of real and sustained suppression of this virus. Now, I suppose you can... Uh, look at that in two ways and you know both of them may be legitimate I'm not uh, suggesting otherwise you can look at that from the perspective that says it is because we have taken this slow uh, careful cautious approach uh, to easing the lockdown that we are suppressing this virus or you can say well we've suppressed it so we should speed up uh, easing of the lockdown the, the danger is so if we speed up the easing of the lockdown too much we cease to be as successful in suppression and it starts to run out of control again. And that comes back to a key point here that the Chief Medical Officer may want to add something to here, that we are at a very critical juncture in this where we could still go down one of two paths, continued suppression or a resurgence. And I just want to make sure that it is the former path we go down, not the latter path. But and my third and final point is, 
when I published the route map, what, three, four weeks ago, uh, now, whatever it is, I said then, and it says this expressly in the route map, that if we can, on the basis of the evidence we've got, accelerate any of the opening up and easing of restrictions uh, beyond where they sit in the route map, we will do that. Uh, and I want to be very clear about that. We're not going to ask businesses to be closed for longer than we think is necessary, and we're not going to ask individuals to live with restrictions on personal freedoms for any longer than is necessary. So all of the time when we are assessing this evidence, then accelerating uh, the lifting of the lockdown is what we are looking to see whether we can do. Um, and that will continue to be the case as we go up to the formal review point of next Thursday, the 18th of June. Gregor, do you want to say a bit more just about how, how fragile and, and critical, I suppose, the juncture we are at just now still is? Thank you, First Minister. I mean, one of the things I uh, want to speak about here is, is just the, the range of sources that we, we tend to get information from when we're judging how to make these decisions. So some of those are what we call lead indicators, things that we get advance notice of. Some of them are lag indicators, things that only happen at a later point. And of course, some of them are through modelling as well. Um, we, we, our judgment certainly still is at this point in time that things are fragile. Um, we've spoken on many occasions about the number of infectious cases and about the actual R number in Scotland just now. And it doesn't take much uh, in the way of um, a rising number of cases um, increased number of um, opportunities for transmission to happen for that R number to, to once again go above one and for us to go into that, that, that exponential growth that we've spoken about um, beforehand as well. But one of the other um, reasons why it's, it's right for us to be um, cautious in terms of our approach and, and, and to be constantly judging the information that we're getting in is, is, is because of the nature of the virus itself. Now, when you think about it, if we establish a bridge of transmission between two people for this virus to potentially infect someone else, it can be up to 14 days later before that person starts to show symptoms of those virus. So it's really important then that we don't accelerate to the point where it's too quick to understand how changing any of these um, restrictions that we've placed upon people actually has an impact on the population. That's why it's really important that, that actually all the way along we're constantly um, monitoring that range of information that I've spoken about to make sure that what we're not seeing in the background is a, a, is a, a range of um, increasing infection. Okay, thanks, Gregor. Um, Tom Martin from the Express. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, if I may just briefly return to the issue of the these letters that went out to the Shielded Group. Um, you obviously, you mentioned in a previous answer, uh, you referenced an administrative error, uh, but the Scottish Conservatives this morning have called for, uh, for the Health Secretary to be sacked, saying this is just the latest of a series of mistakes that have been made. If, if I may briefly just get your response to their call. Um, of course you can. Um, look, right throughout this crisis, and, and people will have heard me, I have resisted um, the tendency to be in any way party political about this. I have uh, resisted and refused invitations I've had at briefings like this to, to be critical of the UK government or to engage in traditional politics. And I'm going to continue to do that because the issues we're dealing with right now are incredibly difficult but they're also the most serious and important that any of us have ever dealt with. And, and actually, uh, they're much more important that can, than the traditional party political arguments and debates that, that we have. Um, but I'm going to respond to the, the Tory call this morning because I think the Scottish Tories uh, statement this morning is absolutely and utterly disgraceful. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't find it surprising. And, and I say this more in sorrow than in anger. For the last few weeks, the Scottish Tories have seemed to me to be not very interested at all in the real issues that we are grappling with and dealing with here. They have seemed to me to be interested only in party politics and trying to undermine a health secretary who is literally working around the clock to deal with the most difficult issues that any of us have ever dealt with. And Actually, I, I think that kind of approach says more about the Scottish Tories than it does about the Health Secretary eh, or about the Scottish Government. And I, I would say they should be ashamed of themselves, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure they have eh, any shame eh, based on the statement eh, this morning. So 
I'm having to say that because they have said what they've said this morning, but that's my only party political uh, comment um, because I actually uh, fundamentally believe these issues are too important. Uh, scrutiny is really vital, and I've said that from day one. I don't criticise anybody for subjecting my government to real and proper scrutiny. But during a pandemic, calling for the health secretary to be sacked is just party politics at its worst. And, and I, ha I don't think it has any place in what we're dealing with right now. So for my part and for the health secretary's part, we're going to get on with the job, being candid where we get things wrong, admitting where we make mistakes, like the, the mistake with the letter, which I deeply regret, but getting on every single day, doing the hard work that has to be done to continue to suppress this virus and get the country back to normality. And nothing is going to distract me from that task. Simon Johnson from the Daily Telegraph. Hi. Um, England and Wales loosened its restrictions on shielded people exercising on June the 1st. Northern Ireland have done it today. Uh, also, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, those people who have been unfortunate enough to be shielding alone over the past weeks and months can meet someone else from, their own, from another household socially distanced. Now, the document you published today says your clinical advisors, and I'm quoting here, are now telling us that the chance of catching the virus when you're outdoors, keeping two metres away from anyone else and not meeting with other people is very low. So what would you say to those people in the shielded category who are extremely angry and frustrated that they have to meet, wait another 10 days before they can go outside when there is such a very low risk? And why can't they meet other people when uh, everyone else in the UK can? Uh, also, could you clarify whether this is just guidance or whether it is compulsory? Uh, this is guidance we are publishing to people in the shielded category. Um, none of these decisions are political in any way. They are driven by clinical advice. Um, and the risks to people in the shielded category, if they get this virus, are exceptionally high. And that's why we are taking such a careful and precautionary approach. Um, and I think that is the right and proper thing to do. Uh, we are advised, I'm advised, the health secretary is, uh, is advised by a, a clinical cell uh, that looks at all of this evidence um, and makes recommendations to us about what is safe and what is not safe. The, the reason uh, we are saying the 18th of June is because that is our next review date and that gives us some further days to make sure that the suppression of the virus that we are seeing in the community continues and that some of the easing of the wider uh, of the, of the restrictions in the wider population are not having a negative impact uh, on the virus. Um, but also the advice to me is that it is still um, a, a risk that they, the advisors believe we should not take to encourage uh, contact between people in the shielded category and those in other households. If and when that advice changes, and I hope that advice changes, uh, in the not too distant future, we will change the advice we give to people in the shielded category. But I want people watching this, however difficult they find this, and I know you find this really difficult. If, if there's one thing I want you to take from what I am saying is that none of these conclusions, none of this advice that we are giving to you is being arrived at lightly or without proper care and attention. Um, we didn't do what the UK government did last week because we didn't think that had been thought through enough and we didn't think the way that had been communicated uh, was, was proper. So we are taking the proper steps to consider this carefully and we will continue to do that. And if we are asking you to restrict the way in which you live your life, it is for your protection and it is not something that we will do any longer than the clinical advice tells us is necessary. I'm going to ask uh, Gregor to say a word or two about how that advice is formulated and how that advice uh, has arrived at the conclusions that it has. Thanks, First Minister. So, so, so the clinical cell that the First Minister has spoken about, there is a large group of frontline um, healthcare workers um, made up from a variety of different professionals and a variety of different specialties. I have to say superbly led by Professor Tom Evans, who's an infectious disease consultant in, uh, from, from Glasgow. And, and they've been providing myself and, and ministers with support for, for some time now in relation to a lot of the clinical guidance that we've been producing. And they've examined this in, in some detail. And, and the guidance which they've offered uh, in, in terms of how we approach the, the, the issue of shielding uh, is at this moment in time, they've assessed the risks and particularly that high degree of risk that people who are shielding face if they come in contact with the virus in the context of how transmission currently uh, sits in the community. 
But, but also I think, and this is a really important point, is the fact that we've just um, changed the restrictions um, only a matter of um, some days ago. And, and what impacts and effects that might have on the number of case numbers in uh, our, our communities at the same time. Now, the bottom line is, is when we've, whenever we change those restrictions, we're very reliant on, again, the public making sure that they continue to follow the rules that are associated with them. And although we have been confident that the, the, the kind of cautious approach we've taken won't lead to a a large or significant impact in the number of cases that we'll see at any point in time. The bottom line is, is, that, is that the risks associated with this vulnerable group were so significant that, that we couldn't, at this point in time, advise them to ease their own restrictions uh, until we could say with absolute confidence that there wasn't going to be an impact in the number of infectious cases that we were seeing across the communities in Scotland. Just to be clear, the, the 31st of July um, date that we have given today is, is a backstop date. It's a date to give us the time that we think we may need uh, to get the clinical and the scientific evidence uh, to, to move to that more tailored, nuanced approach that we want to move to, where people can uh, more safely assess with the advice of their own clinicians their own risks. But between now and then, if we can make further changes, we will make further changes if the advice that the government is getting says that it is safe to do so. So I don't want people to think that between now and the 31st of July, nothing further will change. If the evidence says that we can make further changes, we will make further changes. And we will do that carefully um, and with the, the degree of precaution, given the severity of the risks that the shielded group face if they get this virus, that I think people would expect us to do. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hello, good afternoon. Um, just to return to your earlier comments on tourism and the potential of accelerating some later phases, um, obviously the quarantine plans for, for most families have pretty much ended their hopes of a foreign holiday this summer. Um, do you offer any optimism to people that uh, they, they could get some kind of domestic holiday? As it, as it stands, I think phase three is when uh, leisure travel beyond the local area is allowed. Is there any potential at all that that could be accelerated into, into phase two next week? Um, I, I've got to continue to try to strike a careful balance here. I don't want to give people false um, assurances before we've done the work that allows us to you know, have, have a foundation for these decisions. Um, and you know, I would love to stand here and say you'll get to go on a domestic holiday in a few weeks' time, and, and if that is possible, we will give that advice. But I'm not going to give these assurances before we've done the work that allows me to say so with confidence, and, and that can be as frustrating for me as it is for everybody else sometimes, but I'm going to continue to do that very careful um, and, yes, cautious uh, approach to all of this. Uh, but the other side of that is we will make these changes as quickly as possible um, for all sorts of reasons, for people's well-being, for our own sense as individuals of getting back to some normality. And of course, from the point of view of trying to help uh, a tourist industry that is suffering huge hardship right now, I would love to think that before the end of this summer, people will be able to travel more widely across Scotland. But I have a responsibility to take these decisions as best I can um, in the right way and at the right pace and at every single step we take making sure that the ground beneath our feet is as solid as possible so that we are not giving this virus a chance to run out of control again. Uh, so I, I need to keep taking these decisions in that way but I want everybody to be under no illusions that whether we're talking about the shielded group, whether we're talking about the population generally or whether we're talking about businesses in our tourist sector or any other sector, we will not keep these restrictions in place longer than we deem is necessary. But we all know the, the pain and the anguish and the trauma that this virus has brought in its wake in the form of loss of life, serious illness and the restrictions that we've all been living under. So having gone through all of that, in all conscience, I cannot uh, pursue an approach that risks allowing that to run out of control again. The good news is, as I think we're getting on top of it, um, and as we get on top of it through these other means, we're also having our test and protect system bed down and, and you know gain momentum and traction. 
So we are going in the right direction, but we've got to continue to go in that right direction in the right way so that we don't risk a backwards uh, reverse turn. And that's the, the job I've got to continue to try to lead the country on. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Um, the RMT union say they've written to you today calling for railway enhancement works to resume. It, they say they're confident this can be done safely and that the current restrictions are putting hundreds of jobs at risk um, and could result in major upgrade projects being sent to the bin. Um, what would be your response to the RMT? We're not sending any upgrade uh, projects to the bin. I'm not sure if that's the precise language that has been uh, used. I have seen that letter actually from the RMT and we'll uh, respond shortly. But construction, of course, we set out in the route map uh, that in phase one, uh, construction uh, was able to implement the first uh, two stages of its own restart plan. And we very much uh, want to see construction get going again as quickly as possible. And that would apply to uh, rail uh, works as it would uh, more generally. Outdoor work, as we said before, is uh, lower risk than indoor work. So again, all of my uh, answers on this will come back to the same point. Uh, I've got no interest, zero interest in holding any work up longer than necessary. I've got zero interest in seeing businesses closed longer than necessary and I've got zero interest in seeing the population have to suffer these restrictions longer than necessary. I want us to get back to normal. I desperately, desperately want us to get back to normal. But I have to steer this ship forward in a way that is safe and that doesn't allow this virus to do more damage than it's already done. And that's why I will continue to take these steps with the care and caution that we have done so far. And I would ask people to think, you're know, going back to, I think, Sev Carell's point that, you know, when he was quoting the, the low levels of the virus we now have, maybe that's because we have been going carefully and cautiously, that we have got it to the level we've got it right now. And that says to me, we've got to continue with that, not allow ourselves to become so impatient that we risk giving the virus a free pass to, to spread again. So um, I know how difficult all of this is but we have to stick with the course we're on in order to make sure that this progress is not reversed. Uh, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, on your optimism about possibly moving to phase two, can I just confirm it's the case then that none of the indicators um, uh, we've seen so far um, yet show any spike from the move to um, phase one and the, the, obviously the heat we've had last weekend. And what would the kind of window be before you may expect that to show? And also, are, are, is there any concern in your part about the situation over the border in the northwest of England where um, the suggestions, the R number may be back up around the, the one mark again? Could that have any impact on Scotland? Uh, yes, that is of concern. Uh, if, if the R number is increasing, it to anywhere uh, close to one in any part of the UK, that will be a concern, I think, for the whole of the UK, given uh, patterns of movement and uh, and travel in normal times, although travel is not uh, normal uh, at the moment. And we look carefully at, uh, at the estimates of the R number in, in every part of the UK, and I'm sure other parts of the UK look carefully at Scotland. So we are, you know, we, we have an interest in, in how each other are doing in this for obvious reasons. Um, in terms of your main question, uh, you're right to say that there is nothing right now in any of the data that would uh, give me cause for concern about the impact of the changes that we made going into phase one. But, and it is a really important but that I've got to inject here, it would be too early to see that if there was that kind of impact. That is why we set the three-week interval between one review point and another review point, because as Gregor has just said a moment ago, two to three weeks, given the the, the life cycle of this virus is the time that you really need to, to get a sense of whether there is any impact. Yeah. Do you want to say any more about that, Gregor? Yeah, so, so um, as I kind of started to describe earlier, we, we, we know that the way that this virus behaves is once that bridge of um, transmission is created between one person to another, um, the virus then goes through an incubation period. Now, on average, that incubation period it's probably five or six days, but actually there's wide variation there and it can be up to, to 14 days. And that's why we base all our assumptions on, on that 14 day period. And it's, it's that window that gives us this opportunity to see um, exactly uh, how the virus responds whenever we make any one of these changes. And um, as the First Minister has outlined at this moment in time, it's still 
too early for us to be getting any firm data that's through through that would make a, a, a allow us to make a proper judgment as to the impact of those changes. And over the course of the period between now and next week, when we review those changes, we will certainly have much more data that allows us to be able to make those judgments. But making sure we don't see that negative impact uh, is all about all of us sticking to the rules as they are right now, because the, the changes were carefully assessed. And if we all uh, keep within the parameters of them, then we shouldn't see uh, any negative impact from them. And then that will give us more confidence when it comes to next week to hopefully move into the next phase. Vivian Aitken from the record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, in care homes, um, the, the health secretary very sensibly put out an edict that there shouldn't be a transference of staff between one care home and another. But I'd like to ask why in that case, in hospitals, nurses can move between different wards. I've spoken to staff at a couple of hospitals and one who tells me that nurses transfer from surgical to COVID wards with the only proviso that they do not return to their own ward that day. And another hospital where a nurse working with COVID patients was sent to A&E halfway through her shift. And the same nurse's next shifts were in geriatric wards. Now, nurses tell me if there's a winter vomiting bug on a hospital, they must remain in their own ward until the hospital is clear of the bug. So why then is that not the protocol for COVID? And, and why are nurses um, not being regularly tested at the moment the way they are in care homes? Well, as we've said before, we continue to take clinical advice on the extension of routine testing. I would expect to see us extend routine testing as we go through uh, the next phase. Uh, on the issues around hospital, obviously you've quoted some anecdotes uh, there uh, to me, uh, but the infection prevention and control procedures that apply in hospitals are very strict and rigorous for very uh, good reasons, and we expect them to be implemented not just for COVID, but for any uh, infection that people are uh, liable to have or acquire uh, while they are in hospital. I'll ask uh, both the health secretary and the CMO uh, whether they want to say anything in particular about uh, hospital staff. As the First Minister said, infection prevention and control measures in hospital uh, are well understood and should be implemented regardless of whether or not uh, there is a pandemic, particularly, therefore, in the case where there is a pandemic. And our hospital settings have, uh, from the outset, adopted very particular zones in order to ensure uh, the minimum transfer of the virus between uh, patients who are known or suspected to have the virus and patients uh, who are not suspected to have the virus. Uh, part of the work that is underway, led by uh, a group of uh, clinicians and experts under the leadership of our chief nursing officer, but also with the involvement of the chief medical officer, is looking to see what further steps we should take uh, in order to be absolutely sure that we are mitigating and uh, taking everything that we need to do uh, to ensure that there is no uh, transmission of the virus uh, within a hospital setting. A lot of steps have been taken, uh, good guidance, good practice, and of course, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme uh, is uh, well embedded in our uh, hospital setting and elsewhere in the health service. And as I have said uh, last week and again yesterday, as we remobilise the health service in that safe and gradual way that we are doing against the framework that was published last week, part of the consideration of that group and that boards are undertaking is the testing of health staff in particular clinical settings in order to ensure that we can maximise uh, the safety for patients where that is necessary, but importantly also maximise their sense, as Cancer UK uh, put it, of a safe space for patients to return to receive the care that they need. Yeah, I think the only thing I would uh, add to that as well is, of course, the, the, the major difference um, that, that, that we have to acknowledge here uh, from, from normal times is the use, the widespread use of personal protective equipment in hospitals just now, which, of course, is there and designed for a specific purpose, which is to help to stop the spread of infection, both to individuals who are wearing it, but also to then become vectors for transmission elsewhere in the hospital. And that's, um, that's, that's why we expect 
um, other staff to be given proper training in the use of personal protective equipment for it to be available to them and for them to be using it uh, appropriately in the different settings in the hospital as well. And, and that, again, um, helps to strengthen all our existing world-class infection prevention and control uh, mechanisms that we already have in place. OK, thank you. Uh, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Um, good afternoon. Um, there have been estimates that somewhere like Murray could end up with 10,000 people unemployed as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, is there any, uh, again, it's presumably because it, it, it has a high reliance on hospitality and tourism. Um, is there any particular help you can offer areas like this? And going back to the Creef Hydra situation, there's 240 jobs at risk of redundancy there. Again, is there any specific help? that you can offer these people? We, we'll be discussing with all sectors and, and different companies how we can help. But the, the biggest thing we need to focus on doing is allow them uh, as quickly and as safely as possible to start operating their businesses again. And that's what we remain so focused on. And getting that balance that I've spoken about so often today, right, between moving as quickly as possible, but not so quickly that we allow the virus to run out of control again is the key thing. And, you know, that we've got... Uh, different different strands of support already in place for businesses. The job retention scheme from the UK government is still in place and we will talk to businesses um, about further support that we can provide in the, the weeks and months to come. Um, but let me just be very clear that in every sector and in every part of the country, our focus will be to mitigate as far as possible the economic impact and that is the impact on businesses and the impact on jobs and to get the economy back to a normal way of operating as quickly as possible. And that's true in Murray, as it is in Edinburgh or Glasgow or any other part of the country. Uh, Tom Gordon from The Herald. Hello. Hi there. A, a couple of quick statistics questions. Um, to Jean Freeman, you said earlier on care home testing that the data will be published as soon as possible, but your letter to health board chief executives was very specific. It said the publication would commence on the 10th of June. Is it still a plan to publish from Wednesday? And if that's changed, why has it changed? And to the First Minister, last week you came bearing a sheaf of statistics on people's behaviour on the first weekend of lockdown easing things about police dispersals and travel. What comparable statistics do you have for the second week of the lockdown easing and is it still a cause for concern? Um, the plans for publication haven't changed, but I'll hand over to the Health Secretary to confirm that. Uh, no, they haven't changed. We do intend to publish the first set of statistics on the 10th of June. Um, which is as soon as possible. Um, I don't yet, I had hoped to be able to give the statistics on transport and travel uh, and uh, police activity um, today as I did last Monday. I don't yet have those statistics but we'll publish them as soon as, as possible and when I see them uh, we'll be able to see whether it remains a concern as it was uh, last Wednesday and of course as I said last week we still consider and we'll still consider if necessary uh, moving aspects of guidance into uh, regulation uh, but as soon as we have those statistics we'll, we'll make them available in a comparable way uh, to the way I did last Monday. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thank you very much First Minister. You said that it's likely that at least in part we'll be able to move into the next phase of easing lockdown next week. I just wonder if you could tell me which aspects of phase two are the most and the, the least likely to be moved into if, uh, if all goes to plan. Uh, no, I can't tell you that right now because it would be premature because we haven't uh, completed the review uh, that will allow us to base that decision. Just to be very clear, what I said was that I am optimistic as things stand just now that we will be able to move into phase two. I qualified that by saying at least in part uh, because... I said when we published the route map that it may well be the case that when we move from one phase to another, we don't move into every aspect of a new phase. So you shouldn't read anything into that right now that I absolutely think that we may not be able to go completely into it uh, or, or just in part. I'm just saying that because I always want, as far as possible, to make sure that the, the caveats to uh, what I'm saying are understood as well as the, the absolutes of what I'm saying. But we... 
legally, actually, required to do a formal review at the review point next week. And until we have done that with the, the data that we have at that point, which will be the most up-to-date data, I cannot say at this stage categorically whether we'll move at all or if we do move, as I hope we will, uh, whether we will move into phase two in its totality or in part. But these are decisions that we will take next week and I will outline uh, in the way that I always do what those decisions are and what the basis of them is. Um, and lastly, today, I've got Tom Magner from Carers World Radio. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, as UK Carers Week gets underway today, a new YouGov poll shows that in Scotland, the number of unpaid carers has increased from just under three quarters of a million before COVID-19 struck to 1.12 million now. That's a 53% increase. So has the time now come for the Scottish Government to stop relying on unpaid carers saving the nation money, often a great personal cost to their mental and physical health, and treat unpaid carers as state-employed workers with the pay rates and the legal rights that go with that. If not, why not? Um, well, that's a really uh, important question. It's also a very big question, and I, you know, I, I want to answer it today, but I can't possibly do justice to the complexities that underlie that question in the time I have today. The Health Secretary may want to say a bit more as, as well. I'll be interested to look a bit more closely at the figures you've cited because it's important that we understand them fully. Um, but we know what a huge debt of gratitude we owe to unpaid carers in normal times. But as I've said uh, on many occasions standing at this rostrum during this crisis, uh, that debt will be even greater, both in uh, the, the scale of what existing unpaid carers will be doing, but also there will be people now who, you know, for people in the Shieldy group, for example, who may be providing care that weren't previously having to provide care. So we, we recognise that. And longer term, as we come out of this crisis, there's going to be lots of issues we want to look at more fundamentally about how we have done things in the past and whether these things uh, are right for the future. But there are some big issues involved in that that we have to make sure we think through carefully. In the meantime, uh, and again, Scotland has done more on this front than any of the other UK nations, both in terms of the, the carers allowance supplement. We already pay in the additional supplement uh, that will be paid at the end of June uh, to carers in recognition of uh, what they are doing during this crisis. That, of course, is uh, payable to those eligible for carers allowance. And I know there are uh, some carers who do not get carers allowance, and uh, sometimes they contact me when I speak about this, and I think it's important for me to say I recognise that there are some unpaid carers who don't qualify for that because they don't qualify for carers allowance. And I think that underlines the the necessity for us to always be thinking about what more we can do to support unpaid carers. And that's a commitment that I feel very strongly about. But some of the, the issues underlying the question you've raised require us to think very carefully about how we would move forward in the future. Jean, do you want to add to that? The only thing I'd want to add, First Minister, is I, I do recognise, Tom, that the, as the First Minister says, the underlying issues that you are raising here. And, and I recall uh, from when I was Minister for Social Security, uh, significant work that I was able to do with carer organisations that helped me understand uh, better exactly uh, what people were facing and, and uh, the contribution, the huge contribution that they made. Uh, where carers have raised with me uh, issues around uh, dealing with this pandemic uh, that matter to them or that they've uh, had difficulties with, for example, uh, being able to access personal protective equipment then we have, as I know you know, and I hope we've done it well, taken steps to ensure that that access is there and that advice and support is there uh, to help people look after those that they look after in a way that they are confident is safe uh, for themselves and also uh, the loved one or family member that they are caring for. Where there are other issues that people want to raise, then I hope they know that I am always ready to hear what those are as we try and do what we can in the current environment to help uh, all those unpaid carers, the bigger issue we will get to. Thank you very much. That concludes the questions we had notified today. Um, the people who wanted to ask the questions were notified. I should say we don't get notified of the questions in advance. Um, my thanks to the journalists for uh, asking those questions. Thanks to uh, Gregor and to Jean for helping me answer them today. And my thanks to Jill, our BSL interpreter today, for uh, making this update accessible. Um, can I just say a couple of words by way of conclusion? I suspect for a lot of people watching this today, this has been a particularly difficult update for you to hear. And of course, I'm talking about those in the shielded category. 
Um, but I've got a strong sense today uh, that we are entering now possibly one of the most difficult phases of what we're dealing with, which is not to say any of it so far has been easy because I know it hasn't for anybody. But we're entering a phase now where we do see all of the, the statistics heading downwards. And thankfully for the second day in a row, we've been able to say no deaths were registered in the previous 24 hours. Um, and all of that, I think, does inevitably lead to a sense of frustration that if, if all of these statistics are going in the right direction, why are we still having to live with some of these restrictions? And I think that frustration is perhaps exacerbated a little bit as we go into a phase where some more people, although still a minority, may not be abiding uh, by all of the rules. And I would urge everybody to abide by the rules. So I, I understand that people may be feeling frustrated, and that's the, the general population. That will be even more so for those in the shielded category. And I know that this will have been a difficult update for you to hear in particular. But I just want to end really with, with two things, uh, and they're related. Uh, none of these restrictions are being applied lightly, and none of them are being continued lightly. And that is particularly true for what I've announced today in the shielded category. We are doing this because we think that these measures right now remain essential. For the general population, it remains essential that we abide by this guidance so that we keep all of these numbers going in the right direction. Because the point that Gregor and I have both made today is that the way a virus like this operates, it would be very, very easy for things to start going in the right direction again. So we need to get it even more suppressed than it is right now so that that risk is less when we start to more meaningfully ease these restrictions. But we will not keep them in place a moment longer than necessary. And for the shielded group, we know that even as community transmission reduces, you remain at a heightened risk. So this is difficult for you. I understand that, but it is for your protection. But again, we will not keep you under these restrictions for longer than is necessary. And between now and the 31st of July, if we can ease them any more, we will do that if the evidence says that is possible and doesn't put you at greater risk. And we will continue to work hard to make sure that by the 31st of July, at the latest, we are able to move into a better position where we give you much more tailored advice and allow you to make more informed judgments about the risks you can take and how you mitigate those risks. So uh, I really do, from the bottom of my heart, thank all of you for your forbearance and your patience, uh, because this is difficult and it gets more difficult as we go through the days and the weeks. But please know that every decision we are taking, we are taking carefully with the best interests of you and the country at heart, and we will continue to do that as best we possibly can. So thank you for uh, listening to a, a slightly longer uh, than normal update today. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow at 12.30 um, to give you tomorrow's update. And uh, for now, though, thank you to all of you for watching.